Hi, everybody. Greeting, greetings, and welcome to FIU in DC. My name is Bella Urbina, and I'm a senior here at FIU. I'm a Hamilton scholar. I'm majoring in international relations with a minor in sociology and anthropology, and two certificates, one in Latin American Caribbean studies and another in labor studies. This semester, I'm interning at the American Foreign Policy Council here in DC, focusing on Chinese activities in the global south and national securities in the Middle East. So, as Miami's public research university, FIU welcomes you to our very own embassy here in the nation's capital. Here in Washington, DC, FIU aims to advocate for our students, faculty, researchers, and the greater Miami area. We support our students, like myself, through internships and seminars, and we provide a platform through our partners to hold conversations like these America Roundtables. As this audience surely knows, when it comes to Latin America and the Caribbean, there's no larger cluster of US students that are from the region and focus on the region than the students here at FIU. Our America's Roundtable seeks to foster collaboration with many organizations gathered here today. Today, we will learn a bit more from our faculty that have been analyzing illegal Chinese activity in the region, and we'll be reporting on that here today. So you'll also be learning a bit about our Innovative Security Research Hub, which we know is another key point for why you're all here today. But again, we're also here to listen and to learn. As everyone in this audience has also been focused on the region somehow and through some place, we all have a stake in thriving in the Western Hemisphere. However, before we go on, we would like to give thanks to our sponsors at AT&T and at the BMW Group. I would also like to acknowledge our very own Nicole Regalado, who leaves our America's Roundtable, who many of you know and will be collaborating further with in the future. Also, we're excited that we have so many key stakeholders in the room today and many more logged on virtually. I would like to acknowledge our Hill staffers that are here with us today, in particular representatives from both the House and the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, the teams of our own members, Senator Rubio, Congressman Jimenez, and Congresswoman Salazar, the Congresswoman who was instrumental in recent DOD funding supporting our security research hub. Public servants from our federal agencies, including the Department of State, USAID, and the Pentagon, here also we have joining us today, alumnus John Barsa, the forming acting administrator of USAID. And also today we have representatives from the embassies of Mexico and from Trinidad and Tobago. And now to kick us off, it is my honor as an FIU student to welcome FIU's strongest congressional champions, the Dean of the Florida Congressional Delegation, and important to today's discussion, the Chairman of the House of Appropriations Subcommittee on State Foreign Operations, Congressman Mario diaz Ballard. Thank you so much. <laughs> I will tell you, uh, first, what a, thank you, FIU and all of you, but FIU, uh, when you think they can't do any better and they, they can't impress you anymore, uh, they, always, they always do, right? I am so, just so proud of the work that FIU has been doing, uh, obviously for our students, for our community, but, but I, would ask, I would also mention for, for our nation as a whole. Uh, I want to, again, also thank, uh, thank FIU for what I believe is bringing up a very important issue, a hugely important issue. Uh, for highlighting uh, what I believe is a threat to our national security, uh, a threat that's not gonna go away anytime soon, I would, uh, I would argue that, that communist China is the existential threat to the future of, of the United States and to the entire world. And they're very aggressive, and by the way, I must add, they're also very effective. And they're not limited by a lot of the things uh, that obviously the U.S. government or U.S. citizens are limited to. Um, they will use bribery and they will use any means possible to, uh, to push their interests forward. Um, and they work with our adversaries very effectively all throughout the planet. Um, so I just, I am very grateful for FIU to, to bringing this issue up. Um, in this hemisphere, and so you, in the very kind introduction, you heard about what my responsibility is, right? I, uh, I chair the subcommittee in the House that decides funding for everything having to do with foreign policy, not defense, but everything having to do with foreign policy, uh, everything that has to do with spending abroad, including diplomacy and foreign policy. And we are constantly being uh, 
are, 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 are constantly looking at and seeing exactly what China is doing around the world, and it's frightening. And I mentioned, they're very effective, they're very, very, very aggressive. Um, and they're involved everywhere. You know, we used to think, right, that, well, we're safe because we're surrounded by two oceans, and uh, that's not the case. And I don't care what area you're looking at. Uh, if you're looking at, you know, defense, military, if you're looking at, at uh, artificial intelligence, whatever you want to look at, key areas for our national security, for our well-being, and for our defense, China is involved, uh, and they are everywhere, including, by the way, in this hemisphere. You've all seen the reports about the Chinese involved throughout Latin America, including, by the way, uh, with, that shouldn't surprise us, they obviously utilize uh, those uh, dictatorships that are, you know, anti-American and totalitarian with dictatorships. They always have a friendly face, a friendly uh, reception in those places, and you've seen uh, the reports, which uh, are real, about uh, espionage, uh, Chinese espionage, uh, just 90 miles away from the United States. Um, we also see, and I have a great quote here, actually it's an unfortunate quote, from uh, um, Matthew Millen. Mill Olin. Barza, I don't know if, you, if I'm, I'm butchering that name, right? That's good enough. Good enough. Okay. Assistant Director for Counter Transnational Organized Crime at Homeland Security Investigations. By the way, testifying in front of the Senate Appropriations Subcommittee. Uh, and now this is talking about fentanyl, which as you know is killing, murdering our young people. It's murdering Americans as we speak. But his quote was very interesting. He talked about fentanyl and he said that that, that that is killing Americans begins, quote, begins and ends in China. And we know that's, that's the case. And obviously it's all made worse by the situation in the southern border, the chaos in the southern border. And again, I don't have to tell you 100,000 Americans uh, die now every year. A uh, big, big part of that is because of fentanyl coming across the southern border. But to paraphrase what he says, that begins and it ends with China. They are murdering our young people. I would argue that we could do a lot more to fight that. But uh, regardless, uh, China is frankly uh, the, main, the main entity, the main country, the Communist Party of China. Uh, and they're doing this on purpose. They know what they're doing. It's not an open society. They could stop it. They don't. And obviously, they don't feel that the United States is doing enough uh, to pressure them. So, um, but they're doing more than just that. If that wasn't enough, if the death of 100,000 Americans uh, was not enough, which is insane. I mean, that's the equivalent of an airplane, of, a, of an airliner crashing every day. Think about that. Do you imagine that if that happened, like all of a sudden, you know, an uh, uh, airplane crashed today and tomorrow and the day after, you would think that we would react in a lot more, uh, a much more aggressive fashion than, than we are doing. Because uh, they are poisoning our people every single day. And obviously they have close, close, close ties and security ties with a number of countries, including in our hemisphere. Um, China is South America's number one trading partner. Uh, it strengthened its military ties with countries that are not going to surprise us, particularly countries like Venezuela, and we've already talked a little bit about, about Cuba. Um, they are constantly pushing to, to pressure those who, by the way, for example, recognize Taiwan, the democratic country of Taiwan, and they are very, very, very effective in doing that. Um, they also, as you know, are focused mostly, not mostly because they're focused on everything, but natural resources. Um, they almost have a monopoly, by the way, on uh, the products that are necessary for batteries, battery production. One of the things that I think the United States is forgetting to look at, um, for example, when you look at the energy policy of this administration, is uh, there seems to be a blind eye as to um, who controls who controls what we are incentivizing in the United States for us to do more and more. And it's not a secret that China controls most of the products, including in Latin America, but throughout the world, 
that are required for battery production. And here domestically in our country, as you know, we've actually continued, unfortunately, we are aggressively limiting uh, mining of those products while at the same time um, we know that China is the one who's the biggest beneficiary. I think we need to be a little bit more aware of the secondary effects of our policies and make sure that we're not doing things that directly or indirectly help I think the number one most dangerous enterprise player in the entire planet, that is communist China. So let me just very briefly, because I could speak for a while, you guys know me. Um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, something that I'm very, 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 very proud of, which is, for example, the bill, which is highly imperfect, that we have passed out of, of subcommittee and full appropriations committee, uh, dealing with, again, what I chair. Uh, while every, you know, no bill is perfect, and this one clearly is not as well, but I, but I will tell you one of the things that I'm very proud of, some of the things I'm very proud of. Yes, we're spending a lot less money, because I think we need to do that. But here's the key part. We're spending a lot less money, but we're doing a heck of a lot more with a lot less money than the administration, by the way, was able to do on issues of national security, including confront China, while they were wanting to spend a lot more money. Let me just give you one example. Despite spending a lot less money, we have a billion dollars more than the president recommended to confront China. Why? Because are we serious or are we not? We also have a half a billion dollars, first time ever in that legislation, for uh, foreign military uh, financing, FMF, for Taiwan, the first time ever. Again, something that with a lot more money my predecessors weren't able to do and the administration still has not been able to do. So I'm very proud of that. I also have other provisions in language. Uh, stopping, Ameri I know this sounds crazy, but, and, and it should be a no-brainer, stopping U.S. taxpayer money going to benefit communist China. You would think that that's something that we've already done, but we don't. Um, so we actually have very strict guidelines and limitations to make sure that no money goes to benefit communist China, but we take it a step further, that countries that receive foreign aid from the United States don't, cannot use that money to repay loans to China, which, believe it or not, happens now. So think about that. Taxpayer money is going to countries, great, who then use that money to pay back the loans that they owe China. So to me, that's totally unacceptable. So we have a lot of these very strict prohibitions to doing that. And I would tell you, one would think that at least that would not be controversial. But you'd be wrong. I don't want to be partisan, and I won't. But if you get a chance to read the press release, you know, from the minority party, the leadership of appropriations of the minority party, criticizing my bill, no problem with that, right? Because we do have differences. But um, some of the things that they target to specifically criticize me on is that, that I have a prohibition in the bill from any money going to the Communist Party of China to, 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 and to, and to uh, uh, China. And believe it or not, that is one of the things that they specifically criticize me for. Why do I mention that? Not to be a jerk. You know why I mention that? Because we need to get serious. And that's why I'm so grateful, and that's why I'm so glad that you allowed me to spend a few minutes with you. I'm grateful to FIU and to all of you. We have to be serious about understanding what we are dealing with. This is not a competitor. This is not another country that we compete with, i.e. China, uh, i.e. India, or Japan, or you name it. No. This is, I believe, a regime that is dangerous, a regime that, and when you have a government, a regime that uses, when they train their military, U.S. assets to target, now we should probably take that seriously. We should probably take that seriously. So thank you, FIU. Thank all of you for doing this. It is a cause that uh, will get pushback. You know that. I hope you know that. This is something that will get pushed back, and sometimes from sectors that you don't expect it. Uh, I've seen that. But you are on the side of the angels, because it is not a competitor. 
it is the largest, most dangerous fascist dictatorship in the history of this planet and the wealthiest one. And I'm so glad that FIU is once again, which is why I have never, ever ceased to be proud of this great institution. FIU, all of you are once again leading on an issue which I think is not only a national security issue, but again, I repeat myself, the most dangerous adversary. Um, and as, as dangerous as the Soviet empire was during its heyday, I don't think it compares to what uh, potentially we are facing with this Chinese regime that is a lot more effective, that's a lot wealthier, uh, and that has its tentacles everywhere. Not only I mentioned this hemisphere, but including in this country. So to all of you, thank you. Put up with the trash, because you're going to get hit. You're on the right side. Thank you for allowing me to spend this time with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Congressman, for your words. So now I would like to welcome to the front our very own Leyland Lazarus, who is the Associate Director of FIU's National Security Public Policy Program for the Jack D. Gordon Institute of Public Policy. Thank you, Leyland. Thank you so much for that introduction. Uh, Congressman diaz Bilal. thank you so much for your leadership, sir. Uh, and thank you so much for leading in our counter-China efforts. Thank you so much for your support for some FIU initiatives. Thank you, sir. To Evan, to Vonda, to Andrea, it is an honor and a pleasure for you to be here. You are the true experts uh, in this field. And so we're really excited to hear the panel discussion that's going to be right after this. Alex, <laughs> it was a pleasure to really uh, do this, this program with you. I want to spend a couple minutes just to uh, talk a little bit about the, um, the specifics. Did I do that right? Bigger? How about this? Is that good? All right. All right. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the paper that we wrote and also talk about some specific uh, details, some recommendations, uh, things that we talked about. But I first want to start off with a story. In May of this year, the Chilean police, they finished up Operation Southern Dragon Dynasty. It was a two-year operation and they ended up arresting over 20 Chinese nationals. They found this big hideout with thousands of marijuana plants, with thousands of dollars, with munitions, and they found out that this group was called the Bang Le Fujian, and Bang is, of course, Hei Bang, uh, which is gang in, in Chinese. And the ringleader was actually a legitimate businessman, right? He was an importer. Uh, he lived in Chile for many, many years. And they would meet on the second floor of a KTV karaoke bar, um, a legitimate business. So I start off with this story because it really shows the, uh, the weird mix between legitimate businesses and illegal businesses as it comes to uh, Chinese illicit activities in Latin America and the Caribbean. And so over um, that year, Alex and I, we basically uh, looked at the ways in which Chinese illegal actors have been engaging in this region over uh, recent years. And we ended up deciding that there are four um, priority areas. One is the selling of fentanyl. Second is money laundering. Third is wildlife trafficking. And fourth is human smuggling. Now, of course, we know that Chinese uh, diaspora has been in this region for many years, right? Since the 1800s. And the vast majority of them are legitimate business people, right? Uh, they sell uh, or they own small businesses or karaoke bars or casinos, right? But with those legitimate businesses, you also see a development or an outgrowth of some uh, illegal activity. And over the years, of course, uh, you know, Evan wrote about this over 10 years ago, 
uh, about how some of these illegal groups have extorted uh, Chinese businesses, Chinese business people. Uh, they forced them to pay protection fees, right? Or they would engage in uh, turf wars, if you will. But again, over the years, uh, they've developed into the, focusing on those four uh, areas that I mentioned before. And a lot of these Chinese individuals who are engaged in these uh, activities, they are either directly or indirectly uh, connected to two groups. One is the 14K triads, and the other group is the Fujian Mafia, because of course a lot or the majority of the Chinese migrants uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean come from either Fujian or Guangdong province. So first, fentanyl. As uh, Congressman diaz Bolart had mentioned, right, uh, fentanyl killed um, 70,000 of the 100,000 Americans that died last year, right? Uh, that's almost 200 Americans a day. Um, it has become such an issue that the Biden administration has even called it an emerging national security threat this past April. And of course, the vast majority of the precursors are coming from China. One example of this is just a couple months ago, the Justice Department had officially accused uh, two pharmaceutical companies, one that's based in Wuhan, another that's based in Suzhou. And these business people were intentionally selling fentanyl precursors to uh, Mexican cartels. They uh, advertised their products in Spanish. They also included a whole list on, hey, this is how you turn the precursors into uh, potent fentanyl. They, of course, had an accomplice who would help them launder money via cryptocurrencies. And what's most interesting is that one of their accomplices was a, name by the name of, a woman by the name of Ana Gabriela Rubio Zea, who was based in Guatemala. And she would import uh, fentanyl precursors and then sell them to none other than Los Chapitos, right? the brothers of the notorious El Chapo Guzman in uh, Mexico. And so what this suggests, without of course jumping to conclusions, um, if the U.S. and Mexico um, increase their cooperation to stem some of the, the fentanyl coming across their borders, I mean, the Sinaloa cartel, Jalisco, Nueva Generación, they've been expanding their um, relations and their influence all the way down to Guatemala, all the way down to Ecuador. Uh, it is very possible that they could potentially also be moving uh, some of their fentanyl supply chains uh, down in, uh, further down into Latin America as well. The second, of course, is money laundering. Right? Uh, Chinese individuals are becoming more and more the go-to money launderers for Latin American and Caribbean uh, cartels. The perfect example of this is a report by ProPublica uh, last year, and they profiled a man by the name of Li Shizhi. Li Shizhi is interesting because he was born in Guangdong province, but he grew up in Mexico, so speaks fluent Spanish, fluent um, um, Mandarin, and of course fluent English. And he led an entire operation of money laundering that uh, was in Southern California and in Mexico and uh, even in, in the Caribbean. And the way it works is a Mexican cartel operative would give him or one of his accomplices um, US dollars, then they give them uh, back to the cartel operative in pesos so that they can use it in the local economy. And then on the other hand, they would um, give the US dollars to Chinese wealthy business people who want to use those US dollars to invest it in, say, real estate or to pay for their uh, sons and daughters' um, tuition. And then the wealthy Chinese individual would then wire the same amount of money in renminbi in through um, WeChat or other Chinese social media. Since we uh, released this report, a DEA agent actually reached out to us and said, one, uh, definitely continue to look on the cryptocurrency side, because we've just reached the tip of the iceberg with that. Um, and two, we need to continue to really focus on that. So any researchers in the field, that's, this is definitely a, an area to continue to um, look into. Third is wildlife trafficking. And I'm not going to uh, talk too much on this because we have the experts 
uh, here, right here. But I did want to give a shout out to Earth League International. They released a report in June uh, with John Jay College of Criminal Justice in which they really detailed all of the uh, Chinese criminal networks engaged in money laundering all throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. And I think one group that really stuck out to me was the South America 4 network, uh, SA4, that was based in Bolivia. And that group um, sold Jaguar skins and Jaguar teeth to wealthy uh, Chinese individuals. They would um, bribe customs officials in Xiamen and Fujian province. They would bribe local Bolivian uh, officials. And then they would even facilitate uh, business deals for a Chinese state-owned enterprise, China Ra Railway Construction Corporation. And so that's one of many of these uh, networks, almost 40 of these networks operating in Latin America and the Caribbean. And last but not least, human smuggling. Um, this year has been a, we've actually seen a historic rise in the number of Chinese illegal migrants who are coming from China to Turkey. They fly to Turkey, and then they fly from Turkey to Ecuador because Ecuador has a free, um, a visa-free agreement with, uh, with China. And then they make a trek. They walk from Ecuador all the way up through, um, through Panama, El Tapón de Darien in Panama, all the way through Central America, through Mexico, ending up on the uh, U.S. Southwest border. I checked this morning on the CBP uh, statistics, and almost 18,000 Chinese illegal migrants have arrived at the U.S. Southwest border. Of course, that pales in comparison to the Venezuelans and the Haitians and the Cubans uh, that are coming. But for that category in particular, that is absolutely historic. And so this gives you an overview of the four things that we focused on in our paper. Uh, now we're going to move to uh, the panel discussion. It's going to be led by my colleague, Alex. And we're going to have Evan Ellis, of course, Vonda Felbat brown uh, Andrea Krosta, who's going to talk a little bit more uh, into the details of this, this phenomenon. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so, yeah, I'm Alexander Gocha. I'm a research coordinator <coughs> with the Jack Gordon Institute. Uh, and I want to first extend a sincere thank you to all of you guys attending, both in person and virtually. Uh, when I approached Leland about writing really anything, I approached him with bright eyes and saying, like, hey, I want to get involved in this analytic space. You know, where can we get started? I couldn't have imagined it would end up as something as consequential as this topic and this, uh, this subject area. And so the feedback has been incredible, and I do want to give a sincere thanks to, to Leland and to everyone here for, for this. And so, panelists, you know, come up on board, join the panel. <coughs> and so I'll do a brief introduction because I'm sure the, the topics and the discussion we're going to have are going to be lively. And for the panelists, I do want this to be uh, as much of a conversation as we can make it. So if there's something, uh, a response that one of you guys gives that you would like to give a response to, please do so. And I plan on doing the same. <laughs> Uh, so first, we have uh, Dr. Evan Ellis, who's a professor of Latin American Studies at the U.S. Army War College, who has a focus on Chinese relations to Latin America. Next to him, we have Dr. Vanda Felbat brown who's the director of the Initiative on Non-State Armed Actors and the co-director of the African Security Initiative. And then finally, we have Andrea Crosta, who's the founder and executive director of Earth League International. Uh, so Dr. Ellis, we'll start with you first. Uh, so like Leland had mentioned, uh, you wrote a piece on Chinese illicit activity over 10 years ago. After reading our recent report, what do you think has changed and what has stayed the same uh, regarding Chinese illegal groups uh, in Latin America and the Caribbean? Was there anything we missed or, or something that we should expound upon? Thanks a lot for the question. Um, first of all, I, I want to commend uh, the work that, uh, that Leland and FIU has done here. Uh, I remember... 
I remember about uh, 23 years ago when I, when I started taking a look at China and Latin America. And if you think that there was little knowledge about uh, the nature of Chinese companies and, and Chinese state, especially within the region, um, what was known about uh, Chinese organized crime was was even uh, was even less. Um, and, and certainly, what was available publicly um, and certainly in, in English was was almost non-existent. Um, and, and indeed, some of my own uh, work uh, was uh, focused on on that, just trying to put some basic information out there so it could be a course for informed public debate. And just uh, to, to see the, the, the level of detail um, and the level of importance, and, and certainly also the, the work that was done reaching out not only in, in Spanish, but, but also um, you know, some, some subject matter area, area research and, and, and the research uh, in, in, in Mandarin and in, in the Chinese language. I think just really bringing that and, and putting that out there for, for public debate is, is particularly important. So I just really want to commend the, the, what, what the program is, is done on, uh, on that. Um, and, a few elaborations on that also. Um, I think what, uh, two of the things that I really liked about the report um, is the level of, of specificity. Um, good details on the, the names of the groups and, and the activities, um, and yet without being too technical and too, too inaccessible. I mean, there's, there's some very good sessions talking about, you know, uh, Fujian Mafia, the, the other groups, 14K, et cetera, et cetera, just to, to make that understood within the parlance for, you know, it's something that's, that's very uh, little known. Um, and the other thing, and Leland high highlighted uh, just, just briefly, but um, the whole issue of Chinese money laundering, I mean, this is something that I've seen evolve enormously, uh, that, um, and so you have, you have trade-based money laundering, you have other activities, you have a various type of, of informal activities that for years involved um, the upstairs businesses of, 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 of Chinese communities and, and casinos and, and, and things like that. Um, and yet the scope of what China is doing um, and uh, the, the scope of money laundering that's made possible by China's global reach. I mean, um, Leland only just touched on flying money, which is only one example of, of various different schemes that are possible by, by, by this reach. Um, but part of it is the combination of a number of different factors. Number one, um, China's presence in Latin America, in China, in the United States, in other places, to the role and the accessibility, now greater than ever, of the Chinese banking system. Um, so one of the key issues is that um, unlike the battle days, um, you don't have to smuggle bulk cash across borders. Um, the money never has to change hands. As a matter of fact, it's a matter of you know, the Chinese groups taking control of the money, in this particular case, in the United States. Um, the question of, of who owns the money and when those transactions occur in untransparent um, you know, Chinese financial institutions, it's very, very difficult for you know people working uh, financial intelligence units, uh, treasury, and certainly our Latin American counterparts to really follow the money trail and thus uh, you know go after those groups. But a couple other things I just wanted to, to, to briefly highlight. Um, you know, number one is, is really, I, I've seen just a real deepening of the illicit relationships across the region with, with illicit uh, relationships. Um, I think one of the other things that, that I've seen, um, and again, uh, Leland touched on this, uh, I think, very well, but um, you know, back in 2006, 2007, uh, it was, um, you know, it, you know, Mexico, you were talking about cocaine, um, and of course, uh, some of the synthetic drugs, methamphetamines, and the precursor chemicals out, out, of, out of China. So, you know, back then, the, the big thing was Nuevo León, Zen Li Gon, was the, the big thing that really exposed people to these relationships, um, and the relationships went way back to the days when uh, some of the precur um, some of the. Uh the early figures in what is now the Sinaloa cartel and what later flowed out the Millennial cartel to, to become uh, Jalisco Nueva Generacion um, had some ties in China, trying to bust into the Chinese market. But at the end of the day, those sourcing of precursor chemicals, um, just like legitimate businesses create ties, um, illegitimate business people have created these, these very complex ties. And I think I've seen the, the, the deepening. But certainly fentanyl and the fentanyl supply chains with thousands of different Chinese companies have, have transformed that. Um, another area I think that's relevant to, to talk about a little bit is uh, the, the issue of, of other types of money laundering. Just remembering that it is um, you know, trade-based money laundering as well, which has long been a problem um, in various other, other schemes involving many different groups. Um, one of the things, and again, uh, Leland uh, is always just with exceptional presentation, uh, you know, took you know, some of my thunder on this, but um, the, the issue of the evolution of Chinese human trafficking, there's long been a problematic role. I think it's, it's very important for us not to criminalize Chinese communities because there's so little that's understood about their self-management and, 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 and self-governance and, and self-protection operations, uh, often isolated in, in Latin American communities. Um, 
And yet what we're seeing now is that the people that flow through those Chinese communities in Latin America and elsewhere, there really has been a, a, a takeoff. Uh, again, it was in the hundreds or, or thousands or previously spikes, but you know, to have um, you know, literally just a couple of weeks ago, when I looked at the figure, it was, it was 14,500, um, you know, 18,000 18, as Leland point out, um, but it really is a, a transformation. They always say that the guy that China heard you. <laughs> <coughs> the um, but uh, just and, and just to, to to wrap it up also the um, and of course uh, one of the things that we saw. And the reference was made to um, you know, wildlife trafficking and other things, but certainly the Chinese purchasing networks um, have, have deepened. I mean, it was there was once uh, you know talk about, for example, uh, in, in Mexico and other places, uh, you know, the Chinese intermediaries who would who would buy gold and, and other metals uh, to a certain degree. Uh, you know, some of the consolidators in, in Madre de Dios. Um, but the way in which those have taken off, it's it's uh, Totuaba trade in, in Mexico. It's it, it's the Jaguars. It's the just again the, uh, commend uh, my colleague for just the the excellent field work to identify just the, the, the span of, of these different organizations and, and who they're connected to to help us understand that a little bit uh, well. Um, and then I guess to close by saying some of the things that, that, that haven't changed. And I think, um, number one, I think the number of, in the region, uh, the technical contacts that people have with the People's uh, Republic of China uh, in terms of, of law enforcement in the region, intelligence in the region, um, I, I sadly have not seen much real progress in terms of having those contacts. I haven't seen much progress in, in terms of, you know, if, if there are limited Mandarin language capabilities within Latin American law enforcement, um, the number of people who speak uh, Hakka or, or Cantonese is, is, is even less. Um, in addition to that, um, it continues to be, um, you know, many difficulties in having contacts with Chinese police organizations if, if you want to chase down some things. And so, the things, sadly, that have remained mostly the same, I think, within this evolving sphere are the, the, the lack of knowledge and lack of contacts. Um, and I think that's, that's an area where um, not only uh, there's opportunity for Latin America to look at, at how it works with China more, but uh, ways in which uh, the United States, which uh, we actually have a, a fairly decent, although imperfect, visibility into uh, you know, Asian money laundering capabilities. Um, if there's ever an area where the United States may have ways that we can help our Latin American law enforcement counterparts in figure out how some of these things are so that they're not obliged to essentially open up their books to the Chinese who say, hey, we're here to help, as has happened with Pichue in, in Argentina back, at, back in, I think, uh, 2011, 20, um, 2012. Um, it's, uh, I think this is one of many areas where the United States has a constructive role to play. So I welcome the debate, and uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here. Absolutely. Um, do you guys have any comments before we move on? I have plenty. Why don't you ask her a question, <laughs> and I'll be in my no, talk. for sure. Absolutely. No, and, and thank you, Dr. Ellis. It's Great comments. Uh, I know, especially for for the money laundering and and trying to track down any kind of money trail when it comes to communicating with uh, Chinese financial institutions, it becomes a, a black hole, and and the tensions, especially with the U.S. and and any kind of collaboration, just becomes slim to impossible. It feels like. So thank you, uh, Dr. Felhat Brown. Uh, so you've written extensively on this topic and, and even testified uh, before Congress about Chinese involvement in, in the fentanyl trade in Mexico. Um, I understand that you've recently come back from, from some field research. So is there any new information that you can uh, describe to us about these criminal networks? You know, how is the network uh, between the Chinese pharmaceutical industry and the Sinaloa or uh, Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion evolving over time? And to what extent are the triads or even the uh, PRC government involved? Well, thank you very much. Those are um, fundamental questions, and we have to be both very careful and very accurate uh, in how we answer them and the picture that we paint. And I commend uh, Leland and you on the report for uh, pulling together the, the scope of the information and doing it in a sober uh, manner. So, you know, China continues to be the principal source of precursor chemicals that head principally to uh, Mexico, where the Sinaloa Cartel and Cartel Jalisco Nueva Generacion uh, mix fentanyl out of them and then smuggle them into the United States. Since 2019, China is no longer um, a significant seller of fentanyl, uh, of, of illicit fentanyl into the United States. And I already have to say, when I use the term China, I'm being quite inaccurate. It is smuggling networks within China rather than the government of China, obviously, that is in any way uh, engaging in this. 
most of the fentanyl today is produced from precursor chemicals that are dual use, that have wide use of many illegal pharmaceutical basic chemical activities. And so you will often hear Chinese officials point out that since these drugs today are predominantly not scheduled, and there is virtually no prospect that they would be scheduled, that China cannot act against those um, supply networks. So China is accurate that those drugs are not scheduled and that creates significant challenges um, for enforcement. And that is also true about methamphetamine, which uh, today overwhelmingly is produced um, from non-scheduled chemicals, widespread use, very little chance there will be chemicals. Nonetheless, um, some of the sellers um, very obviously are selling to criminal organization with explicit knowledge that they are selling to criminal organization and often advice uh, Leland spoke of the uh, U.S. Uh, indictments that came out in June. Uh, those are very important uh, because they sort of counter the narrative that since these drugs are legal, uh, there can be no uh, uh, enforcement uh, action. China often um, uh, posits uh, that it is really the responsibility and fault of the United States for the burgeoning demand for fentanyl uh, and that China um, it does not share responsibility for uh, the drug trade. That statement is problematic in many ways. Let me just highlight one. Fentanyl is a radically different drug than cocaine. It's a radically different drug in heroin in very many different ways in, about which we can talk about the Q&A. But it's also a fundamentally different drug because it's one that is not that is pushed by traffickers. In this case, the Sinaloa Cartel and Jalisco Nueva Generacion. It's not the drug that users have been actively um, asking for. China will also say, um, look, you know, all the problems of criminality, smuggling, poor uh, law enforcement, customs control in Mexico are the fault, the problem of uh, the Mexican government. And indeed, the rule of law uh, in Mexico is extraordinarily poor and collapsing. Uh, but non nonetheless, China disavows any kind of responsibility. I, I think we really uh, have to be very careful in how we phrase the relationship between actors in China and uh, the Mexican cartels. Certainly, there should be no blanket suggestion that the Chinese pharmaceutical sector uh, is implicated in this trade. Specifically in fentanyl, um, we're often talking about quite small middle-level companies, often individual brokers that are selling the precursors. For the Chinese pharmaceutical sector, uh, pharmaceutical sector there is a tiny little amount of money to be made out of uh, uh, the uh, precursor trade, for uh, precursor illicit trade. And it is also true about what is called triads. So the large mafia-like companies like 14K that um, we think about. Um, unlike in the crystal meth trade, um, which Chinese criminal triads dominate in Asia Pacific, not in the Western Hemisphere, which is dominated by the Mexican. In Asia Pacific, the 14K, um, Bamboo United, a whole set of other triads uh, dominate crystal meth trade because that brings a lot of money. The sale of precursor chemicals is extraordinarily cheap. You're talking 10, 20 million dollars, probably covers all of the precursors needed. I know you can kind of round up add, put it to 50 million dollars. Still, that's, that's nothing. That's pocket money. Uh, is what is the value of selling precursors for fentanyl production. Here I'm hitting on one of the other fundamental factors that it's so different about fentanyl and synthetic opioids. Um, um, more broadly, the price per value, the potency per value ratio is just orders of magnitude different than anything heroin or cocaine uh, or other plant-based drugs uh, can achieve. So what it consequently means, again, that it's a very different criminal landscape than a whole set of other um, uh, Chinese criminal activities, uh, not just in the sense of who are the uh, uh, all actors involved, including very little value for large Chinese pharmaceutical um, uh, actors, but also for the criminal actors. It's a very different space than in the uh, meth uh, trade. And incidentally, one of the issues to watch is what's happening in the Asia-Pacific meth market and the increasing competition there between Mexican criminal groups and Chinese criminal groups, including the quote-unquote uh, triads like 14K. 
the final two comments I want to make are uh, the following. Because precursors are so, fentanyl precursors are so cheap, and for that matter, meth precursors also, but there's more money in meth precursors because of bulk. Um, all of a sudden, paying back in uh, commodities, such as wildlife commodities, becomes very feasible. It's very difficult to generate enough money um, from a particular region to pay back a billion dollars worth of dues. But it's very easy to generate uh, 10, 20 million, do million dollars to pay back uh, for precursors uh, in doing so in um, natural resources, commodities such as wildlife. And of course, China is um, the world's largest uh, demand market for uh, wildlife products, whether they are plant-based or uh, animal-based, for Chinese traditional medicine, for speculation, for a whole variety of things that you will uh, hear um, from Andrea and I'm sure um, uh, Evan as well, and, and certainly I can um, um, continue speaking about those issues as well as we move on. The, the exchange, uh, the, the convergence of the drug trade and the wildlife trade, the illegal drug trade and wildlife trade, um, uh, becomes um, in the Mexican, Mexico cartel space uh, very intense. And it's dangerous in multiple ways, not just because of uh, the threat that synthetic opioids pose, um, not just in the United States, but in North America and our beginning to spread beyond, but also because of a whole set of issues that wildlife trafficking brings from the threat of zoonotic diseases in continually vastly unprepared Latin American countries that, that have not increased their awareness, readiness for zoonotic disease emergence uh, to uh, uh, the threat to biodiversity themselves. My final comment here, you know, the report highlights and um, um, Evan um, spoke about the lack of cooperation between uh, Mexican, uh, between Latin American more broadly, uh, law enforcement uh, actors and Chinese actors. Uh, but here is a kind of moment where I think, you know, uh, careful what you wish for. China is in fact very intensely selling its law enforcement services around the world, across Southeast Asia, in the Pacific region, as well as in Africa and Latin America. And it is often selling law enforcement uh, methods uh, that we should question, uh, that um, both limit the investigative capacities and focus uh, of their partners. Um, China is, for example, very determined not to allow any criticism, let alone exposure of issues like uh, China's role in illegal fishing uh, or illegal uh, logging. But China is also predominantly state, uh, selling um, technologies, such as smart cities and other law enforcement technologies, uh, with the potent um, narrative that Western law enforcement assistants have failed over many years to uh, make Latin America safer. Latin America is still the place of the most violent criminality by orders of magnitude, radically more so uh, than, for example, East Asia. And that China now has these technological fixes that generates uh, significant concerns about backdoor spying, uh, but also about threats to human rights and civil liberties uh, under the guise of um, anti-crime uh, policies. Uh, so um, encouraging um, effective law enforcement uh, is certainly desirable, but one needs to do it in ways that are um, safe both states and citizens and that focus on uh, these dimensions as well. And um, I'm delighted to be sharing the stage, uh, not just with the authors of the report, Leland and Alex, but also with two uh, pre uh, preeminent experts, uh, Evan and uh, Andrea. And looking forward, Andrea, to your remarks now. Perfect. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Felber Brown. That was amazing. Um, for the sake of time, we'll just move on. Um, Mr. Costa, you and your team at Earth League International have done some of the most groundbreaking work on Chinese illegal wildlife networks operating throughout Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, and most recently, the New Yorker magazine had a great feature on you and your investigations. In fact, you've even done a, a podcast with, with Leland, which enjoyed that. Um, can you tell us a bit about the, the concept of converges, convergence, excuse me, and describe a few criminal networks that you've been able to uncover and, and some of the characteristics that, that you saw from them. Sure. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. And, uh, and it's kind of 
really cool to um, talk about those things after this, the first two incredible uh, presentations. I'm still thinking about what you said. Um, yeah, so my organization, myself and my team, we have been investigating um, environmental crime and also wildlife trafficking for over a decade. Um, um, we have been focusing on uh, the trafficking part of the problem, not so much on the poaching, not so much on local communities. Since the beginning, my obsession was to able to investigate as high as possible within these networks. And really, after knowing where they are and how they do it, what they do it, I really wanted to know their names. Okay? I want to know the names of the people on the top last name, first name, address, telephone numbers, who are they? And this is what drove my work for the past 10 years. Uh, to do what we do, uh, we operate kind of as a small intelligence agency in the sense that we proactively recruit sources and informants all over the places uh, that, that feed us with a lot of information constantly. And then using different ways and different means, we get really close to those trafficking networks and their members. And over a period of time, is a sort of social engineering work, we get their trust, and we are able to collect a lot of information about them. And of course, we collect uh, all personal information and how they do what they do, but we collect uh, photos, videos, conversation, financial information, geospatial data, uh, where they send this, the, their kids to school, where they invest in real estate, what they eat at breakfast. That's what, everything is important for us. Uh, then all this information is passed to our analysts and they do additional work uh, uh, whenever it's possible also investigating these people, this network on social media because uh, some of them leave uh, a digital footprint behind. And then all these is put in a confidential intelligence brief, CIB, that we share with partner law enforcement. This is in, in a nutshell what we do. And uh, we work, we have been working very well with the uh, uh, Homeland Security Investigation, for example, they do exceptional work. Uh, um, we have been sharing information with them for a number of years. We also work with Fish and Wildlife and other entities. Sometimes we work uh, with law enforcement uh, abroad, and then maybe we can discuss in the Q and A. It's a whole different uh, thing, sharing mm -hmm. information with uh, um, agency from, for example, in Latin America. At the moment, I we work, for example, all over the Americas. Latin America, and I don't know a single law enforcement agency with a uh, capable Chinese translator, for example, just to give one reason. So it's, if you don't have a Chinese translator, you, don't even, you cannot even start an investigation on these people. And uh, so by doing, what, by doing what we are doing, so try to investigate as high as possible, you, you, you meet, you stumble into crime convergence, of course. Crime convergence is not a new thing, of course, whoever has been working on mafia or terrorism, uh, of course, there is a lot of crime convergence, but it's relatively new in the environmental space. Um, and these networks are, and this member, are, by convergence, I mean the same people and the same networks involved in multiple things. So at the same time, they traffic uh, jaguar fangs, shark fins, and timber, but also illegal mining but also human smuggling, human trafficking, and money laundering, and corruption, and working with organized crime at the same time. And they do it locally, regionally, and globally. And uh, so that's why we, uh, we joined forces with John Jay uh, College of Criminal Justice to, uh, to, we came up with our own paradigm, crime convergence, environmental crime convergence paradigm based on four types of convergence, species convergence, or multiple species traffic at the same time, environmental crime convergence, so they do logging, fishing, mining at the same time, serious crime convergence, so money laundering, human smuggling, drug corruption, of course, and then network convergence. They work very well with each other globally. Uh, uh, in the past a couple of years, in Latin America, we've been offered several times rhino and ivory in, from Latin America, and the ivory and rhino they were actually in Malaysia and South Africa, but nevertheless, they are able to do this globally. So in other words, they move money, people, commodities effortlessly across the world, uh, and they're really good in doing that. So uh, 
So an example of three networks, uh, there is, for example, one network. We, we have been working a lot in Mexico in the past few years. We identify around a dozen different uh, trafficking networks, most of them Chinese run. Um, and one in particular, for example, is based in, uh, we call it M1, it's based in Mexico City, uh, Chinese run. Uh, we started with uh, wildlife trafficking, mostly Totoaba and shark fins. And then slowly we understood uh, that we got a lot of money. We, we spent a lot of time with them. So this, this network is also really good in smuggling people, especially Chinese workers, to Mexico and then to the United States. They work with officials at the Mexico City International Airport. They do it with that. And then they also do work a lot in money laundering, specifically with the two main cartels. And so they're really good in money laundering for themselves and for others, mostly with flying money uh, slash hawala if you want to use the, the Muslim world system. Uh, there's another one in uh, Peru, uh, big in seafood trafficking. They uh, lots of shark fins. By our calculation, estimation, based on what they told us, and then we work with biologists, this network alone is responsible for almost half a million sharks fish every year, just one network. At the same time, they do timber mining, money laundering, they're in bed with the Fujian Mafia, they're in bed with the uh, Primero de Capital in Brazil, and so forth. Uh, another example in Colombia, uh, they're big in, again, shark fins. It's a, it's a great commodity, shark fins all over Latin America, but also a lot of timber. They, according to what they told us, they, 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 they are managed to send, uh, they managed to send 500 containers of timber every year to, to uh, China. So, <clears throat> in order to understand their impact of organization like ours, you have to first understand the impact that these networks have on the planet, not only natural resources. And uh, uh, these networks and these people uh, are part of what... So we have a very unique point of view because we don't have an external point of view, we have an internal point of view. We, we sit, we are we have lunch with these people. So we see the words as they see it. And we see the problems as they see it. So uh, I can tell you that these networks and these people are what, after many years doing this, the only way I can describe it, it's not easy to describe, it's like a global gray infrastructure, a global mesh, a network of networks constantly moving is alive and they and these people are they have their hands absolutely everywhere and 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 the same people that traffic wildlife or money laundering or do money laundering or human smuggling some of them are connected to the same people who that uh, uh, who uh, opens illegal police uh, stations in, in the US and Europe or buy legally agricultural land in the US or real estate or, or traffic fentanyl. So it's, uh, in my opinion, is crucial to change the way we collect information about this mesh. And one way to do it is intelligence. There's no other way. There's no other place you can get this information. You have to get there and get it. Um, and this is in essence, I hope I explain uh, what is, it, it, from our point of view, crime, environmental crime convergence. It's fascinating what Earth League International has been able to uncover, and we're unfortunately running out of time. But uh, for the last question, it's directed at the, at the three of you, but we'll have to keep responses short. Um, Leland and I offer several recommendations for Latin American policymakers, Chinese uh, policymakers, and U.S. policymakers of what was recommended in the paper. Uh, how would you assess these recommendations? If there are any that resonated the most with you, if some are more realistic than others, and then if there's any that we missed, uh, let's try to do like. I have to be here because there were many. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's start with you, uh, Dr. Ellis. Sure. No, thanks for the question. And actually, I want to tee off something that, that the Wanda said, but also just my also feeling just what, what an honor it is to, to be with such uh, two very esteemed colleagues. And I think you can see the importance of having uh, number one policy recommendation is is the importance of, of having publicly accessible detail and nuance available to policymakers, and not just the you know China bad you know networks, um, but understand what is really happening and you know country by country and network by network, so you can formulate you know accurate 
and not overblown policy responses. And so I, I really commend the, the work that you do. Um, the other thing I, I think that uh, Wanda uh, pointed out uh, is I, I think there's a broad issue, a policy issue in Latin America and also for us. Um, we're used to hearing about uh, Latin America's interest in Chinese investment, uh, Latin America's interest in Chinese trade. Um, but in addition to the insecurity that, that Wanda you know, talked about in, in Latin America, um, there really is an emerging Chinese offer, an offer to you know, help with, with technical collaboration, an offer to provide digital services, whether it's uh, um, you know, smart cities and safe cities or, or other uh, more, more limited things, um, uh, offers to provide training. We, we see it across the board with, with local police forces. The Chinese have been very open in their policy statements through the China Slack Forum and, and elsewhere that they're interested in, in building these type of relationships. And so um, one of the dilemmas, I, I think, for, um, for, for the US and for Latin America is what are the conditions in which you accept and how far do you go? Um, understanding that, again, there are vulnerabilities when you, know, you say any time uh, you know, to the Chinese authorities, um, hey, come in and take a look at the corruption in our networks and, and get to know us well. Um, and so um, just like with trade and investment, my, my gut feeling is because of the, the need, you can't say don't trade with China, you can't say don't accept Chinese investment, um, but you have to, in the same way that you have to do security engagement, you have to do it intelligently from the perspective of strong institutions um, and a diversity of, of partners. And so I think the, the, the really the, the question of, of how does Latin America work with the US, work with China, and, and work with others to expand its capabilities and expand its networks to, to, uh, to, to go after this holistically. Um, and I think the, the final thing, and this goes to a, a point that came out in the, the report, is what is the appropriate type of dialogue that Latin America needs to have with the PRC o over this. Um, I place myself thoroughly in the middle. Um, you know, there are certain, certainly many things that the Chinese government um, is in no hurry to, 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 to help the region out. I mean, when uh, you know, uh, you know, President López Obrador of, of Mexico uh, sent that, that open letter saying, oh, please, President Xi, you know, tell, you know, you know, help, help us with fentanyl, and, and President Xi said, Fentanyl. What, what fentanyl? Just, just in the same way when, um, when uh, the uh, the Peruvian government uh, suggested that maybe there were hundreds of, of, of Chinese deep water fishing fleet ships off of their coast, you know, the Chinese embassy said, "Fishing fleet? What fishing fleet?" Um, the but the but the, the issue is the dialogue, whether it's in forums like like CELAC or whether it's in forums like like the OAS or whether it's in, in um, bilateral forums. Um, Latin America needs to stand up for its own interest and, and not worry that by demanding more transparency and collaboration, it's somehow going to put its investment risk in something. And so how does Latin America position itself to have those tough conversations with China, not just rolling over and, and, and allowing you know, Chinese organized crime to, to do what it wishes, um, but having it in such a way that um, you know, Latin America feels that it is not somehow putting its equities at risk by having these difficult conversations. And I think those, those are issues that we're going to have to explore. Uh, absolutely. Um, I have written extensively on um, what the United States can do um, vis-a-vis -vis China and fentanyl precursor and fentanyl trafficking. I won't repeat those. Let me kind of focus the reflections on um, what, in my view, is in the realm of feasible and a good direction for China, Latin America, productive law enforcement cooperation. Uh, so the, I just want to reiterate what I had said in um, my opening remarks, that a part of the conversation uh, should be human rights and civil liberties, but there is often very little interest and tendency among Latin American um, uh, partners to be emphasizing those issues in their engagement with the Chinese government and frankly with other governments. So encouraging that thrust uh, is both good for citizen security, uh, but it's also good in keeping check on some of the risks uh, of backdoor and the technology and uh, other law enforcement assistance from China uh, provides. Second, I want to highlight uh, what um, Andrea said and uh, to which I have testified in several of my recent testimonies, that we, we, the United States, but also our Latin American partners, really need to invest far more uh, law enforcement and intelligence resources in focusing on wildlife crime um, and elevate that in uh, the uh, intelligence collection priorities because it is a great mechanism to get at a whole set of other um, issues and both at home in the US, let alone in Latin America, the, the, those issues still remain vastly emphasized, both in law enforcement focus as well as in um, intelligence focus. 
And finally, let me kind of think about uh, what, uh, how does China respond and how does China think of its law enforcement? So first of all, China is enormously proud to uh, often uh, posture and identify itself as the world's toughest um, cop, particularly drug cop. And often China does uh, take very harsh and severe measures on a whole set of counter-narcotics issues, even though this then stands in at variance with the actual implementation of some of those policies. But in scheduling all uh, fentanyl class drugs, for example, something the US Congress has not yet passed, we only have a temporary scheduling uh, of um, fentanyl, China can say that they have the toughest laws on the books for the deadliest uh, drug um, itself. So then using this framing that China likes to uh, wrap itself in and this, this posture of being the toughest drug cop uh, or toughest cop period is a good uh, mechanism and entryway to be uh, encouraging uh, the conversation. China often, uh, when it is confronted with the complicity and role of its um, um, criminal networks or uh, legal companies engaged in criminality, its first reaction tends to be to deny that. And we have seen consistently this pattern in Southeast Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. Nonetheless, when it is over time confronted with the evidence, uh, it will take action. It's perhaps not focus complete action, but there is some action. And the reason why China doesn't take complete action is because, um, particularly when we're talking about big criminal networks, such as the quote unquote triads, the large Chinese criminal networks, they are often used um, by Chinese government officials or uh, at their own activity as providers of a whole variety of services uh, to the Chinese government way before uh, the uh, media were captured by the issues of uh, Chinese law enforcement, um, Chinese unofficial, semi-legal, illegal uh, police stations, uh, the triads, other Chinese criminal networks were serving that same function. function. They were essentially extra-legal enfor enforcement and monitoring of the Chinese uh, diaspora in Africa, in Southeast Asia. Uh, extending that to uh, Latin America. They oil uh, the money for corruption, and hence, by and large, China tends not to dismantle uh, the top leadership, even when it takes limited uh, targeting actions against some of them when confronted with big, evi with big evidence. Uh, and the final comment that I want to make uh, here is that um, the issue of um, illegal fishing is particularly interesting because um, Unlike um, wildlife trafficking, uh, and, and to a large extent, even illegal logging and mining, large, uh, chi large Latin American legal uh, fishing industries are raising that as an issue with their government. Now, let's be completely clear. There is tremendous amount of government and uh, uh, fishing industry complicities in Latin America in illegal fishing. In all the places where there is tremendous Chinese illegal fishing, Argentina, Ecuador, move it north, move it south, there is tremendous amount of illegal fishing by the very uh, industry of those countries. Nonetheless, and they have for decades kept um, on purpose the regulation very weak and its enforcement essentially non-existent. But they are now raising a voice because they have competition from China's illegal fishing. So here is an important opportunity to latch onto it and both expand activities to counter uh, illegal uh, behavior in natural resources, uh, but also uh, counter uh, uh, some of the uh, networks that it then links to China. Thank you. And finally, <coughs> I'll, be, I'll be quick. Uh, just uh, following up on what Svanda said, super important that sometimes these trafficking networks and quote unquote triads are kind of an extension in those countries of, of the Chinese government, and they do a lot of stuff for, for the Chinese government. Um, uh, I really like the long list of recommendations, and there are some of them that may be um, relatively easily implementable. I don't know, the loophole of Ecuador, for example, it's an, all our targets use Ecuador for a lot of things, so that, that, of course. But when you start talking about cooperation, collaboration, joint uh, you know, capacity building, joint law enforcement, and this and that, don't forget 
the mesh that I tried to describe before. You touch one thing and it's connected to another thing, three, four. Three. So it's it, you think you're dealing only with this entity, but actually this entity is, is linked to a lot of other uh, different entities. Uh, we've been working in a country in Latin America for a while. We published a very little report publicly, and then we went back to this uh, country six months later, and we discovered that the most important Chinese traffickers received an SMS, a text from the embassy saying, hey, you know, keep a low profile. What does it mean? What that, I, leave, I leave to you understand what does it mean. They know each other. They know personally. It's a random text messages. They got scared because of what we published. But keep in mind that you never know who, who you have in front of you. By law, by the way, every Chinese national around the world is a spy, potentially. I know it's, I know it's a stronger uh, say what I'm saying, but it's, it's by Chinese law. So they have to do it, even if they don't want to. So the ex exert extreme cautious when, when talking about, we need collaboration, of course, without their collaboration, we, it's over, <laughs> but it's not as easy as it sounds. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Crosta. And unfortunately, we don't have time for Q&A. We can save that for the reception outside. But that concludes our panel, everyone. Thank you so much. And thank you to the, to the panelists <coughs> for, for joining us and talking about this. So now we're going to shift over and provide a brief demonstration of our Security Research Hub virtual platform uh, and show you some of its capabilities as it relates to uh, Chinese activities and, and other security <laughs> challenges in, in Latin America and the Caribbean. Test, test. All right, perfect. All right, so moving on to the, to the final section, it's just a brief demonstration and an explanation of our Security Research Hub uh, online platform. And the Security Research Hub uh, is a virtual online community meant to bring together the US, its partner nations, uh, private sector, civil society, and really just whole of society uh, to understand uh, the most pervasive issues uh, within Latin America and the Caribbean. And the way it does that is through different means. So it's an open source platform, meaning we collect and aggregate open source resources, whether it be data, information, articles, you name it. If it's available, we want to bring it in. If it relates to Latin America and the Caribbean, we want to bring it in. And since you know, we understand that uh, China's a major player and a major security challenge for the United States and for Latin America and the Caribbean, we built out uh, the Chinese uh, activities dashboard, which is like it sounds, uh, a variety of, of dashboards and tabs on Chinese activities. Uh, I'll walk around now. Uh, and so the first one that we have up on the screen is the, the Peace Arc, which if you're all familiar with the Peace Arc, it's not unlike, uh, I think it's the USS Mercy? Comfort. Comfort, I'm sorry. It's, oh, there you go. <laughs> It's like the USS Comfort, which is uh, basically a hospital ship that goes around providing uh, free aid to countries ac around the world. So China has their own version of this, and it's a, uh, a, a measure of soft power, I guess, or, or a tool for soft power that China can use when, when navigating these developing countries around the world. And so what we did was map out each of those locations, provide a brief uh, uh, explanation to what it is, because I wasn't sure initially, and I'm sure you guys weren't either <laughs> that this existed. Um, but it's just uh, you know one of those measures of, of soft power. Uh, another measure that, or another tab of this is is just public diplomacy, and so we have a, a news feed provided to us by the China Signal, which provides you know up to date news on basically everything China does in Latin America and the Caribbean, negotiations that take place, agreements that get signed, uh, developments that that happen as it relates to uh, mines and investments and, and things of that nature. Um, Confucius Institutes, if you're not familiar, Confucius Institutes are basically uh, another, um, a, a, another way for, for China to influence university systems within these countries by developing these, these cultural institutes that study Chinese history and Chinese culture 
um, at these different university institutions. And then overseas development uh, finance projects, um, which like they sound are development projects that are financed as, as loans or, or different mechanisms uh, to build up different infrastructure projects uh, all across Latin America and the Caribbean. And then uh, I'll ask Leo and come up because we can talk about uh, so our problematic projects dashboard, which I'll let him explain. And yes, real quick. So the problem set that was identified to us was that different government agencies. Oh, it's on. Great, awesome. I don't need it. I don't need it. So different government agencies, uh, U.S. Em the embassies, State Department, Department of Defense, USAID. They all track Chinese problematic projects or malign behavior, but there wasn't a one-stop shop dashboard to really put it all together. And if they did have it, it's all in the classified space, can't really share it with uh, many partner nations. And so what we've, our attempt is to put this on a one-stop shop, open source dashboard, right? Working with the State Department, the regional China officers who are in the um, various countries in Latin America and the Caribbean, We've identified 55 projects. We know there are a lot more than 55, but we're gonna start with those. And each of these are Chinese projects in the region um, that have engaged in environmental damage, corruption, labor violations, undue delays. And so here to the left, you can scroll down, you have the, basically the list of all these different projects and a quick summary of whether it involves you know, civil society or protest, political protests associated with it, yes, right? Damage to the environment, yes. Damage to fragile ecosystems, yes, right? Um, of course, you have pie charts to show the project sectors, uh, country breakdown. You see Ecuador is a, is a huge uh, recipient of, of quite a few of these projects. And then here to the right, you have a list of all the state-owned enterprises along with their sectors of operation, regions of operation, Here's a little um, summary of the, pro of the company itself. And then here are, are the summary of alleged violations, not just in Latin America and the Caribbean, but also outside of the region as well, right? Um, so an example that we love, love, love to show is, um, oh, two fingers, sorry. There you go, there we go. Uh, Coca-Cola Sinclair Dam, right? Everybody knows about uh, this one. Um, built by a Chinese state-owned enterprise, Sino Hydro, uh, 2016. Fast forward to today, and it has 17,000 cracks in it. It's causing environmental damage. The Ecuadorian government is suing um, the state-owned enterprise for its shoddy work. And so you can click. I can go further, by the way. You can actually see the, the project itself. But you can click on it. And here to the left, it comes up with the project name, the year it started building, the sector that it's in, the infrastructure project that it's in, right? But you can also uh, find the company itself and see Sino Hydro, in addition to the Ecuador um, dam, also had an issue in, in Bolivia, right? Also had an issue not just in uh, Latin America, but in North Macedonia, there was a road construction uh, issue with murky bid negotiations. Uh, in 2014, World Bank blacklisted Sino Hydro. And then in Bangladesh, uh, there was issues with uh, some of its projects with extensive delays. And each of these are all corroborated with uh, articles in English, in Spanish, in Portuguese. And so we're hoping that this would be useful for U.S. government officials, uh, that it will be useful for investigative journalists, right, in, on the ground, in the field, who can use this if they want to do some more background research on the very Chinese projects that are um, happening in their countries. Perfect, and I'll, I'll also add that this is very much a version one of what, what we've created. Much of what we're expanding to is to include uh, the subsidiaries for any of these companies uh, that are involved in these projects because as many of us know, it's not as simple as saying like, you know, hey, that's the company, we can link them back to China. They'll often work through subsidiaries and so all that information we wanna make it clear and present uh, for the end user. Um, and then I'll run through the, the rest of the tabs quickly, but like many of the other measures of influence that, that were discussed, uh, both within the panel um, and that you know, some of us are familiar with uh, as it relates to Chinese engagement and, and Chinese activities. So information and technology is, is another area that, that we look at. Um, grabbing, again, open source data from uh, the Australian Policy Institute, we were able to map out uh, Chinese uh, technology company projects, telecommunications, commercial partnerships, 
uh, research partnerships, safe city projects um, all across Latin America and the Caribbean, and, and even using uh, some investment data from uh, AEI to see, you know, in what countries is China investing money into, into technology. And then uh, economics as well. So, you know, amount of Chinese loans, amount of uh, Chinese investments. And for any of these, you can, you know, scroll up and down and find uh, the investment amount, the year, the, the sector, because China is very much ingrained in most of society across, the, you know, the developing world. And so these, these different tabs map it out. Uh, civil security engagements. So to what extent are these... Uh, are, are China operating with uh, local law enforcement within any of these countries? So you'll see like the engagements themselves and how it looks uh, across the region. And again, these are uh, still early data sets. So this one is actually an original that uh, Leland had built out, but you know, we're continuing to, to grow and, and add more to it. And then a strategic and, and dual use infrastructure. So ports, for example, seaports that were financed by China uh, all, across the, all across the region that you know, for some of these, they're open and, and available and, and for commercial use, and, and for others, they're closed off and, and only the, the Chinese can use them. And then also mapped out our uh, ground satellite stations that China uses to communicate with, uh, like, its satellites up, up in space that for some of these countries, they have access to the stations, for others, they don't. So it's, you know, Chinese-funded or Chinese-operated uh, all across Latin America and the Caribbean. And then uh, the last tab, again, because we're open source and we want to share this information with as many people as possible. We have a link to, to all the data sources that we pull from, whether they be original or from uh, other organizations. Because you know, the, the data is out there and we want to give credit to those who put it out there. We're just visualizing it to make it easier for all of us to understand really just what's going on. Um, and the security research, um, uh, let me see, yeah. So, the Chinese activities dashboard is just you know one in a in a suite of dashboards that we have. Uh, small arms light weapons, for example, maps out um, instances of, of weapon seizures, uh, usages, um, recaptures all across the region. So you have an understanding of, of the weapons trafficking situation all across Latin America and the Caribbean. Uh, the small arms light weapon story map actually provides a narrative on just you know what a problem this is as it relates to counterfeit weapons being trafficked throughout uh, Latin America and the Caribbean. Central America border security uh, maps out different um, border security organizations throughout Central America and, and migrant deaths. Um, and then uh, <coughs> the lithium mining dashboard, which maps out uh, lithium mines in Bolivia, Chile, and Argentina, as well as their, uh, or and includes their ownership structures. So all of this, this data and these dashboards are available uh, right now on the Security Research Hub. It's srh.fiu.edu. Um, and if you have any questions about it or how to access it, how to access the data, feel free to talk to me or, or my colleague out in the, in the reception. Um, and I do want to add, um, I don't know if he's still here, but I do want to thank uh, Congressman, or Congresswoman Salazar and Congressman uh, diaz Bilart for being one of the proponents of the Security Research Hub and ensuring that it stays funded and, and can be uh, a resource for, like Leon had mentioned, for, for researchers, for policymakers, for journalists, and for really the and anyone who can benefit from this type of information. Um, so with that, I think we can conclude. Um, yes. Yeah. And so I'll leave Thank that. you all for coming. We're actually going to lead into the reception right now for some refreshments and feel free to chat. And again, if you have any questions about the Security Hub, don't hesitate to ask. Thank you.